Hello, I'm Michael Liebreich and this is Cleaning Up. The mining industry lies at the heart of the net zero transition. Not only is it responsible for coal, which still produces more emissions than any other commodity, it will also have to deliver the minerals required for the new clean energy and transport sectors. No one in the world knows the mining sector better than my guest this week. Mark Kutifani started his career in coal mining nearly five decades ago. He then worked on a number of different minerals before ascending to the CEO role at Anglo-American. He's now chair of Vale Base Metals, leading the charge on extracting nickel and copper in particular, which will be so essential for the net zero transition. Before we start, if you're enjoying cleaning up, please make sure that you like, subscribe, and leave a review, and tell all your friends about us. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe to us on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform, and follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, or Instagram. Over the holidays, we moved the Cleaning Up newsletter to Substack, where you can find it on mlcleaningup.substack.com. That's mlcleaningup.substack.com. Dot com. And don't forget, there are over 170 hours of conversations with extraordinary climate leaders on cleaningup.live. That's cleaningup.live. One more thing before we get going. I'm also in the process of launching a brand new substack called The Thoughts of Chairman Michael. The aim is to create a single hub, bringing together all my written audio and video output. You'll find everything from links to my conference speeches and Bloomberg NEF columns, exclusive thought pieces on the transition, and miscellaneous blogs on stuff I've found interesting. I'll be posting new content regularly, so make sure you subscribe. Search for The Thoughts of Chairman Michael on Substack, or if you can spell my name, go to emilybreich.substack.com. That's emilybreich.substack.com. See you there. Cleaning Up is brought to you by our lead supporter, Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gillardini Foundation. And now, let's bring in Mark Cutifani. Mark, thank you very much for joining us here on Cleaning Up. Great to be here, Michael. Thank you. So, I've got um, two overall goals or two themes that I'd like to uh, explore overall during our conversation. Um, obviously, during the transition, we're going to use a lot more minerals. And yep. so, one theme or one question is going to be have we got enough? Is this going to be feasible? And the other one is assuming that we can do it, um, how do we do it ethically and with justice? Um, and can we expect this mining industry, of which you've been a huge part, a huge leader uh, for 40 plus years, can we expect that industry to do it in a way that is just? Uh, and so those are the two themes. Can we do it? And how do we do it right? Um, can we start by you explaining to the audience, you've been described to me as the daddy of, uh, of mining. That's the, the, uh, the, the podcast where I first heard you speak, uh, which is a great friend of mine, uh, a mutual friend, I think, Adam Matthews and uh, David Hickey. Um, they described you as the daddy of mining, I think. And, uh, but can you explain your, you know, give us the potted buyer, the short version, because you've done so much, of um, what you've done and what you're doing now? Well, first thing is, I'm glad they didn't call me the granddaddy of mining, <laughs> so they haven't aged me too much, but probably the daddy's a fair, re a fair reflection. I guess uh, Adam's referring to the time I've been around. Uh, 47 years in the industry, started in a place called Wollongong, just south of Sydney, working in coal mines. So I literally walked out of high school uh, working uh, underground at a place called Coalcliffe, uh, producing coal for steel manufacturer. Did that for 12 years uh, with a company called Rio Tinto, which you probably know. I then worked in the gold fields of Western Australia, uh, where we developed the world's, or sorry, we developed Australia's largest gold mining operations. I then worked uh, back in on the East Coast, the Hunter Valley in coal again, then back to the West Coast working in nickel. Uh, copper and a uh, small amount of precious metals. I then uh, worked with a couple of companies again in gold, uh, Sons of Gwalior and uh, Normandy. I then went to Canada 
working for Inco in copper, nickel, precious metals, cobalt. I then went to South Africa working uh, as the CEO of Anglo Gold Ashanti, um, again, a, a large uh, a South African-based uh, company, but it was a global uh, global operations. And then uh, 10 years, almost 10 years in um, Anglo-American here out of the UK, uh, retired in... And you should say as CEO. As CEO, yes, yes. You'll be, you know, I don't know if that was modesty or an omission, but, uh, but definitely a, you know, the leadership role, yeah. Yeah, and then... Um, I uh, retired in. Uh, I retired, handed across the role uh, in April two thousand and twenty-two, and since then um, I've taken on the chair role for Vale Base Metals, and that's a, another interesting role, which is very much focused on the energy transition in terms of the products it produces. I'm also a, a non-executive director of Total Energy, so I get to watch the energy transition from on the inside. Uh, also a, a senior non-executive director for Lang O'Rourke, the construction group out of the UK, chairman of the Power of Nutrition, based out of the UK, uh, Global Foundation, um, Development Partner Institute, a whole range of other activities that are around charities and non-NGO type activities. Right. So now, if that doesn't establish your sort of right to speak or your uh, your your um, credentials, uh, because you've talked about um, you know, just in that short overview, you've got uh, you've got some coal, uh, you've got actually oil and gas as well through Total Energies because that's their their heritage. Uh, you've mentioned nickel, you've mentioned copper, you've mentioned some well, a lot of precious metals. I don't know about base uh, well base metals. Base metals uh, yeah. uh, whether you've got some um, rare earths in there as well, I'm sure you have. Um, you've also been during that period a a major spokesperson for, broadly speaking, I don't know if we were allowed to call it ESG anymore, but responsibility within your industry. So um, give us the the sort of the, what's the timeline of that? I mean, is that something you realised right from the start back in the Wollongong days that this is this industry needs to shape up, or is that something that dawned on you because you know to the point where you then became a leading figure in that uh, trend? Well, it's, it's always been at the surface or somewhere bubbling around the surface of who I am. I grew up in a coal mining city, Wollongong, uh, which also had a steelworks. So I understood the interaction of mining with local communities. Uh, my first manager's job was as a coal mine, and I can remember we had a flood, coal washed down into the local neighbours' backyards, and I was out in the backyard digging the coal and cleaning the yard back up with Mrs Smith, literally. And uh, the importance of engaging and, and her appreciation, the fact that we were all down there uh, cleaning her yard up and we got chatting and she, she didn't realise I was the, the manager and uh, we ended up chatting. So I used to go back for a cup of tea uh, once every six weeks and she'd tell me about the community, what was happening in the community. I'd tell her about the business and what we were doing. And she appreciated that we're an important part of the community because so many of the locals were employed. And at the same time, that engagement and talking with her about what was happening helped us play a more effective role in the community, connecting with the neighbourhood. And, and we became, or we were, part of the community. So that's always stuck with me. And I've always tended to be... Um, somewhat socially orientated as well. Um, and so as you, I guess, grow and develop and you see different ways that you can have an impact from the position you have in the business uh, and how positive the response from the community can be. Um, so it's just been part of my DNA, I guess, in growing up. And But that journey from that, that time took you to be really a very vocal uh, champion of the mining industry as a force for good and also as a force for environmental good. Can you explain your logic there? Because most people listening would, be, would say it's a kind of necessary evil and quite a big evil, but you don't subscribe to that. Well, firstly, I, I, I'm also probably one of our harshest critics as well when things aren't managed well. So I think you have to tell the story both ways and there's no doubt when things go wrong as leaders we have to be front and center we have to make sure it's cleaned up we have to deal with the issues we have to learn from the issues and i remember going to south africa uh, back in 2007 
And in the first week on the job, we lost nine employees at work. And uh, for, for the year, we had 35, uh, 34, sorry, fatal incidents. And so what we did to correct those sorts of issues were very important. So you have to tell the whole story, not the bits you like. In terms of mining, a uh, very simple point that I make and something that, that we don't do very well, uh, mining conjures up an image of digging holes where we really should be calling ourselves the materials industry because everything that we all use in our daily life either comes from mining or it's grown. And if it's grown, it's usually processed by the products of mining so that it's usable. So in terms of what we provide, the Greeks understood mining's role in society. When they talked about air, water, fire and earth, today I use air, water, energy and minerals as being the things that make our lives work. And so telling that story has been something that, that has been very important to me and certainly has generally got a constructive reaction. And regular listeners to Cleaning Up um, will have listened uh, a few weeks ago to Ed Conway, the author of um, Material World, and yep. he talks about, uh, he, he, he took us through sand, uh, what is it? It's sand, salt, copper, steel, oil, which is shorthand for him for oil and gas, um, and lithium. And so we've got an audience hopefully out there who understands just the sheer scale and also the complexity of the supply chains and the cleverness of the technologies and how they're processed. Um, but so, so we, yes, Minerals still very important. We don't have a kind of ethereal, digital-only, services-only economy. We're actually still digging up a lot of stuff. Um, but you make a strong argument that this is uh, that without it, the world would be a much worse and environmentally worse place, right? Well, I'm making an even stronger point that we can't create matter, and everything comes from the earth. Uh, whether it's agricultural products, everything comes from the earth. And so materials, products from the earth have been since have been with us since day one. That is an immutable fact of life. And yet people sort of think we have discretion on mining. We don't have discretion. Now we could recycle and do a lot smarter things, but at the end we can't create matter. And so what I'm saying is I'm in the industry of materials. I'm just a materials boy. Um, and that's what we do. We produce the materials that make the world work. And we're not very good at telling the story. And certainly from my perspective, that's been a, a, a role I've taken on for a lot of years when, again, engaging in a whole range of stakeholders, pretty clear they didn't understand how the world worked. So we've got the Just Stop Oil movement out there, possibly also, in fact, probably also, I know some of them uh, listening to this because I have them, I've, I've had even some of the uh, um, supporters, proponents of Just Stop Oil or Extinction Rebellion on the show. What happens if we just stop mining or just stop materials? We die, period. We die. You're exposed to the elements, so we talk about shelter, food, shelter, um, all of the things we need to survive come from the earth, even uh, indigenous groups. In fact, indigenous groups understand the importance of the earth more than we do. And I go back to the ancient Greeks who understand that the use of the earth for everything. And when I say we die, I'm not being glib. Fertilizers, without fertilizers, we can only feed 4 billion people. So are you or I going to decide which 4 billion don't survive because we stop fertilizers? There was a, a recent exercise done in the Netherlands and the head of McKinsey's, the economist from McKinsey's, was telling me they had a debate with 400 university students who said we should stop producing fertilizers and we're not going to use fertilizers and they're the most significant exporter of flowers in the world. And so they had a good debate. And he said, can I add one fact to this conversation? That without fertilizers, we can only feed half of the world. And he said, would, would we like to discuss which 4 billion people aren't going to survive as a consequence of the decision we make? And because they talked about stopping fertilizers around the globe. The, the debate was for about the next hour around that issue. And then he put it to a vote again. 
and said, so who believes we should stop using fertilisers? Not one person voted for that decision. The conversation around how we do it better, do it more appropriately and make the right decisions on how those things are used was the better conversation. And mining, I put it into that same category. Um, we need mining for everything. So that's the that's the bull case or the support case, right? But the fact is that um, this is an industry which has a vast history of misbehavior as well. Um, whether it's um, environmental pollution, just uh, rivers, watersheds, um, also tailings collapses, um, you know, the uh, Brumadinho tailings dam disaster, which killed a few hundred people. Uh, that was a Vale mine, the majority owner of the company you now chair. Um, You've got uh, the issues of corruption, bribery, people flying around. Just, And we're not talking about history. We're talking about recent, recent events. Yeah. You've got the Jukan uh, Gorge, um, you know, the, the, the Rio Tinto blowing up this incredibly important, you know, 46,000 years of continuous human activity. And some mining company just decides that... that and, and I guess I'm interested in... in, in whether this feeling that we're doing so much good and everybody dies without us justifies, is used psychologically to justify that sort of behaviour. Well, firstly, you might use the word behaviour as though there's a deliberate action to do those sorts of things or do the wrong thing. And, and let me say that um, in my experience, most people associated with the mining industry believe and do the right thing. There are, in all walks of life, people that don't follow the rules, don't do as they should, and we have problems. And we're no different from any other industry where there are problems. But for every case where I see something bad or something that's not done appropriately, I can give you a hundred cases where it's been done well and no one hears of anything because it's been properly operated. So we've still got a long way to go to improve what we do. And none of us in the industry would say that we've got it all right. And certainly from my point of view, we can do better with risk management. We can do better on environmental. We can do better on safety. And that's a continuous journey. And we've still got a long way to go. And we could tell our story a lot better than we do. So yes, all of those issues are issues, but we're getting better. And I hope we'll continue to get better. So I think I'll, I'll give you the kind of the benefit of the doubt on getting better. I, that, that one, but well, the, the, the but, statistics but the fun, seem yeah. to indicate right. that and, to be true. But the fundamental question: of, Is this a good industry with a few bad apples, or is this a fundamentally, um, how can I put it, um, you know, an industry that's got fundamental problems of governance, ethics, etc.? I mean, the companies that are being caught doing these things—they're not fly-by-night operations. We're talking Glencore, Rio Tinto, Barrick Goldfields. We're talking about Vale. I mean, these are these are the leading players. I mean, if they're not, you know, I, I haven't mentioned. Anglo-American, you'll notice, um, but you know your so maybe you know maybe it's all your other all your colleagues, but you know you meet these people at all the conferences, you talk to them all the time. They have the same investors, and those are the companies that are being caught, you know, bribing on an industrial scale, and uh, and and just you know you can't argue that blowing up the 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 Yukon Gorge was a sort of a mistake by one person. That was throughout that company. And, of course, executives' heads rolled as a result, quite rightly. So, firstly, um, I've never presented the mining industry as being perfect. It is run by human beings. And from time to time, human beings make poor judgments. They make mistakes. Risk, as we think, have issues in control, aren't as in control as we thought. And so there have been issues. I'm not absolving anyone uh, in any industry, and in particular mining, from those issues. I won't talk about any specific issue, but if I could talk to, let's say, an experience. So, uh, and I use Anglo Gold, uh, Anglo Gold, sorry, Anglo American. I could use Anglo Gold as well. And just point to the improvements we made, which mirror many of the improvements we've seen across the industry. So firstly, safety. Um, 
accident frequency rates improved in terms of fatalities occurring at work, um, we reduced by 97%. We had one fatality in 2021, one too many, and obviously zero is the target. First time in 100 years, we had zero fatalities in South Africa with the deepest mines in the world. Environment, 30 spills or exceedances down to zero in the last year. We had significant improvements in health. In fact, in 2007, there were 78 people impacted by um, tuberculosis, which is connected to silicosis. In 2021, zero cases. In terms of 2007, 1,000 people in the organisation passed away due to impacts of HIV. In 2007, one. 2007? That's 2000, sorry, 2021, 2021. one case. Wow. So massive improvement on a whole range of areas in terms of social performance, significant improvement, not perfect, but significant improvement over the years. And if you go to the ICMM statistics for safety, again, significant improvement over a long period of time, but not yet at zero. And there are very few industries that are at zero, but we're approaching what we call safe industry status on those statistics. So there's a whole range of examples showing that we're improving, but we're not perfect, still got a long way to go, whether it be a corruption issue and other issues. Now, the other point I would make is we have the formal sector, but we have a greater amount of people actually involved in the informal sector, which is artisanal mining that requires a lot more work. Now, a lot of the larger companies are now starting to work with governments to help the governments develop guidelines for managing artisanal mining for safety, health, environment. And for example, De Beers doing Gem Fair in Sierra Leone. Uh, a number of other companies are now working with the artisanals to try and improve their practices with government. So long way to go. <clears throat> yes, you can point to issues and, and problems in the industry, but we are getting better, but we agree that we've got a long way to go and everyone's trying to get there. So that, that's very persuasive to the point that we can do mining in a just way because that's a, those are fantastic um, you know, case studies. It's poignant for me, by the way, because I do a lot of work on road safety, particularly bus safety in London, where most of the people listening to this would think, well, there's no problem. And they could not be more wrong. London has the least safe bus system of any European city. And um, we actually have more killed and seriously uh, injured on the buses in 2020 two, three, then in 2016. Um, and it's just blighting families in the hundreds. It's killing people, you know, in the dozens during each mayoral term. And there's no cultural sort of acceptance of that, not within Transport for London and not within the general public. So, uh, you know, now the, the parallels there are pretty strong. But now you're talking my language. So <clears throat> one of the ways that we've been able to explain what we do in the industry and our performance is to bring it back to social norms or things that people connect to. So if I said to you today, South Africa, the mining industry, it's actually safer to work in a deep underground mine in South Africa than it is to ride in a London bus. Now, that would be a bit of an extreme comparison. Right. It's not the riding in the bus that's dangerous. It's the being anywhere near the bus, outside the bus that's the most well, dangerous. Although well, slip strips and falls, actually, people do get injured and, and, uh, and even killed uh, because of uh, the buses sort of zooming into and out of bus stops. But and if, you look, if you look at the fatality yeah. frequency, right, and, and, and it's a lovely conversation. It's actually a very good conversation. I asked Jim Joy, Professor of Risk Management at Queensland University, and I said, how should I think, this is as, a, as, a, in my, uh, as an operations manager in Nickel back at Western Mining uh, back in 2004, and I said, how do I, should I think about what level of safety performance is acceptable to society? And he said to me, he said, Mark, you should look at the fatality frequency rate on the roads. He said, as a mining industry, we've got to be doing much better than that statistic because people can relate to driving a car and it's something they can connect to. And if you said we're much safer working in an underground mine than driving your car on the roads, you're connecting with people you're connecting with what people can relate to. So by the time we finished in my period at that operation, we were five times safer than driving 
the car on the road and and was a significant improvement but we've got to keep improving because road safety keeps improving we all keep improving the airline industry has done some wonderful work in terms of safety that that we use as a guide in terms of risk management but it's a continuous improvement story it, it's a fantastic conversation and we, we I could I could happily spend uh, the next half an hour on that because you know as society it's very strange we accept zero fatalities uh, when we fly. But on the roads, actually in the US now, it's something like 40,000 fatalities a year. Yep. And they're just kind of accepted. It's just extraordinary. And in uh, you know, m- mining, it sounds like parts of it are moving towards that kind of zero fatality acceptance. But there are still parts of it that are perhaps not there. But um, so if that speaks to the question of whether we could achieve very high ESG, environmental, social and governance standards, we could get there. Um, there's... The industry is in the crosshairs of a few major um, pressures. So one is uh, the whole divestment or the whole whole how to reduce what it's doing on the fossil fuel side. And the other is how to grow in the copper, the nickel, the base metals, the the rare earths and so on. Um, Let's take those in order. In terms of the coal, so Anglo-American, you demerged. demerged. So you you took the thermal coal activities, which were only about a few percent by 5%, value, less than five percent, less than five percent by value. You put them into a separate company. Yeah. Can you talk through why did you decide to do that? Because there were other options available to you: shutting it down, selling it to somebody else. And why did you demerge? And how did well, firstly what happened? Shutting it down was not an option. The government owns those resources. We pay a fee to rent, exploit, sell. Um, and these were in South Africa, principally, yes, at the yes, time. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. So from their point of view, the coal was a resource, their resource. We explored, found, invested, and and uh, extract those resources for export. And they said, well, that's not your decision to stop. So you don't get a, you don't get to make the decision to stop. You can sell, you can do whatever you like, as long as it's commercial and appropriate, but you don't get to stop um, developing those resources because they're a resource for the country and that's our decision, not yours. That was very clear. When we looked at it, we could have taken the cash or we could have demerged. And for for our investors, what we thought was we will demerge so they'll have two pieces of paper and for those investors that said, you know what, we don't want to invest in thermal coal, they could sell out and, and hold their Anglo shares. And for other investors who said, you know what, I think thermal coal is going to be a really good place to invest in, we'd like to keep our shares. So we gave them the choice. And for us, we thought that was the best way to deal with the issue in a very open and transparent way. The government was satisfied with the way we did the work. There were a number of environmental commitments that were made as part of the demerger, and those things have been honoured by July and the team. And at the same time, investors got to make their own decision about what they were prepared to invest in. So I think it's turned out to be a model for those that are looking at separating from their thermal coal assets. From the perspective of the business community, the investors, certainly, um, that business, um, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, Tungela? Tungela. Tungela. Um, Record profits, uh, buying other mines, investing, growing the amount of coal. From a climate perspective, that's pretty disastrous, is it not? Well, again, it's not for me to judge what they've done separately, but again, um, what they've done is consistent with what the government has said is within their policy limits. And again, the one thing we couldn't do was put constraints on them after they were outside Anglo-American on the basis of the feedback from the government. So uh, these issues are matters of policy and we work within those policies. But again, we said, look, people don't want us to be operating in thermal coal. We made the decision to step out. It was a small part of the business. The other thing... Uh, with those assets is they had relatively shorter lives. And so for us, it was one of those debates that within the next five years, we probably would have divested in any case. So it, it wasn't a difficult decision for us to make. But at the same time, people think we're in control of those resources. We're not. The government, it's they're subject to government policy as they should be. 
so once again, this may be um, it may be that you know your case study, the the ones that you have been involved in, are, are sort of poster child pinup uh, of how to do this. But isn't the risk more broadly within the industry is that the better run companies, which are as we've established, other than Anglo uh, American, perhaps not that well run because they're lagging in these things. But the better run companies divest to people who really are not interested in any of this, not safety, not environment, not climate, um, and are much more opportunistic and um, and not subject to governance, not subject to transparency. So- it's, a, it's a difficult one, and but you're asking the right point. Now, in my view, those types of assets are probably best kept with those that you know will do the right thing and, and manage them appropriately through the transition. But unfortunately, that's not how the world is working at the moment. Just Stop Oil is a good example. Is The world can't afford to just stop oil. Um, it can't afford to keep going where it is either. So how do we transition in a way that look at, looks after the whole global village? It can't be just this group or that group. We've got to transition in an appropriate way. So these things are far more complex and require a lot more thought. And just stop this or just do that doesn't work if you want to preserve people and planet. Right. So just stop, which I you know, brought into the conversation. I mean, that that we, we've agreed is a naive approach, the just stop. But, but, but I understand. Is, but but I do understand. The, if you take the 2050 or in the case of a, a, a global South country that, that has you know, committed to 2060, I think South Africa, 2070, India, um, over the next three, four, five, maximum five decades, we absolutely have to just stop. Because that's what the planet, you know, that that's that's just the physics of of the planet, um, and so you know the transition does involve essentially two pieces, running down, and you can call it transitioning away, you can call it phasing down, you can call it phasing out, but it does involve exiting one set of resources and growing another, and I suppose the, you know we'll get on to how do you grow the other, the transition minerals that we need. Um, but are we? Where are we in terms of how do we phase down, phase out, transition away from? Um, it, 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 do you think we're on track to do that? Are the signals being sent to the owners, whether they're governments, investors, companies, uh, or are they just going to keep investing and creating demand by investing? Look, I, th- I think there's no doubt based on the data we've seen, we're all moving too slow. That that for me is a really important issue, and the dialogue has been, in my view, naive in many ways. Now, let me use the comment on scope three emissions. So scope one, scope two, you're in control of your emissions, and that's been the real focal point of the companies I've been associated with in reducing our scope one emissions, whether it's solar, introducing solar renewables, clean energies, um, building the world's biggest off-haul road truck, Uh, which is both fuel cell battery and powered by solar, those sorts of things we did in trying to make sure the Anglo footprint was reduced materially, including the use of dual and a whole range of other things. Um, We have to make sure that we can do everything we can to, to improve those positions, but at the same time, there's a cost. And so the pace at which you can do that has to be has to be invested in and you've still got to deliver return. So how do you get all of those moving parts working together? But also in the mining industry, scope one, particularly thermal coal, I mean, if you look at Tungela, their scope one, scope two will be 3% or 5% of the real problem is their lifeblood is selling thermal coal with the CO2 going up into into the atmosphere. So let me go to scope three, which I think is the wrong metric, it's it's almost, you know, it, 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 it's irrelevant. It's actually the scope four emissions. And people say, what do you mean by scope four? I'm saying, well, wait a minute. Scope three just stops at the steel producing plant. So in many of the major groups, their most significant scope three emission is at the steel plant. But what people forget is steel is the most single most important metal in the energy transition. So when you take steel, and we and we did some calculations that showed that at 
where the world's got 45% of its primary energy is coming from renewables, the amount of steel that is used to support that production would be net carbon neutral, even with metallurgical coal being used because of the credits you get back for the carbon elimination. So in actual fact, we should be measuring scope four, that is full life cycle costs of those materials. Scope three is arbitrary. I've shared this with the political leaders in the UK, and I'm hoping that that lands we actually measure these things properly. But that is, with respect, what you've done there, I've seen, I see what you've done, right? Because I've, I've been doing this for nearly as long, not quite as long as you, but nearly as long. What you've done there is you've taken credits for avoided emissions, Correct. right? And the problem with that is that some piece of the economy being zero emissions uh, and then some other piece emitting, but take, but saying, well, we're allowed to emit because it would be worse without us, doesn't get you to net zero. Oh, no, no, I agree. Absolutely. But, uh, but, but, uh, but um, it's a better measure than scope three because the scope three doesn't drive the right behaviour. Now, the yeah. second part, yeah. which I do concede, which should be done, is then how do we make sure the steel producing is, in fact, carbon neutral on the basis that we get to the hydrogen? Now, that's 20 years away. But how do we encourage the right behaviours all the way through the process is absolutely critical. Uh, and by the way, you, you may not know this, but I'm a very big critic of Scope 3, which is actually designed to act as collective punishment. And a lot of people like using Scope 3 because it points the finger at the fossil fuel companies. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it makes them responsible for what essentially we are all doing. The question that I posed, though, was the, the danger... And, and so, you know, if you absolve them so I'm aligned with you, Michael. I'm but aligned if, with you. Maybe, because I've got there's a but. The but is that if you have these fossil fuel companies or countries, whether it's UAE, Saudi Arabia, Canada, whoever, once they invest in the fossil fuel output, does that stimulate demand? In other words, if the real goal is to shut down the demand or replace the demand so we can still have good lives but do it in a clean way... But if you've got a bunch of people who've invested, who've got stranded assets, who've got pension fund money invested in production of fossil fuels, does that not stymie attempts to ratchet down demand? By, by definition, it's going to you know, reduce the costs of fossil fuels and stimulate their use. So I think the points you raise are absolutely right. Shouldn't we be in a debate how we do this together and transition quick, quicker together. And the government has to be the one to actually promote the right conversation. Now, I've made this point to both government and opposition members and said that it's really important to get to the scope for or the broader circular economy. We should be talking to the circular economy in this debate to get those issues resolved. Because while we... I think, fiddle and fart around with scope three, it's the wrong debate. It has to be circular economy. How do we get to a place where we really are uh, taking carbon out of uh, uh, the mix? And I don't think we're in the right conversations. We think we are, but we're not. Uh, that's we're certainly not, um, and some of the you know we, we see the debates kind of almost like a fake debate or kind of these are ritualized debates at things like the COP meetings. But however we hold that debate, there will be winners and there will be losers because you are transitioning from one set of assets to a different set of assets. And so the losers are, in my, I would suspect, however you debate with them, not going to go gently into that good night. And that's part of the issue. But I want to switch to the other side, which is the winners. Right? There are there's a whole bunch in your industry and you are, you know, you are the chair of a company set up to expand dramatically the output of particularly nickel and copper, I understand, right. from the violet assets. Um, so let's let's talk about the transition minerals. The, the winners in all of this are going to be these minerals um, that are going to be used in clean energy, whether it's electric vehicles, whether it's transmission grids, whether it's the steel in all of those offshore wind uh, turbines or, or the, the rare earth uh, that goes into the magnets that are required and so on. Um, is there enough of this stuff? Are we spinning our wheels? But and you know we, we're going to do. We're going. To, I'm sure we're going to talk about nuclear as part of this. You know, are we spinning our wheels or spinning our turbines, spinning our PV panels, thinking that there's enough of these minerals to 
largely affect the transition based on renewables? Well, there are there are enough of these minerals on the planet, but getting access to them and developing developing them in the right time frames, I would say there's not enough to achieve our outcomes, and that is something that we have to address together. But I I don't think it's that simple either because um, you know, humans are innovative and can find different pathways and routes and. Uh, if the price of copper goes too high or the price of nickel goes too high, then there'll be substitutes. There'll be other ways we can do things. There'll be the material sciences, I think, are going to be critical in finding solutions where we don't have enough of this, then we'll, ha when we'll use another product. might not be as efficient, but it'll get us there. So I think there'll be lots of work. One, we don't have enough materials or we can't get at those materials quickly enough. We'll end up making compromises. We'll... Um, what we call reduce our consumption. Uh, we will use different products. But again, I think humans are, are, are uh, very innovative and will find solutions, but it's going to be a bumpy ride because we, the straight line access to getting there is not a straight line. And that's the problem. So it's an optimistic picture. Let's just frame it in terms of you know twenty fifty net zero or yeah. twenty. I mean, you know, they, I've always thought that by twenty one hundred. It's actually a hopeful picture, not necessarily an optimistic picture. Ah, well, there's two different sorts of optimism, which I love. There's um, uh, Paul Romer, the co Nobel Prize winner, talks about. I don't know how he phrased it, but it's sort of passive optimism. I hope I get a nice Christmas present, yeah. versus active op optimism, which is that's an amazing tree I could build a great tree house in it and so you're more you're the active optimist correct and, and so my work is about waiting the debate so that we can get access to the materials so we can get access to the materials and do the right things and also think about the backup plan that won't work and so I've always said in in my industry as a materials guy uh, my relationship with the materials or the material sciences groups is really important to understand what's the best material, what's second best, what's third best, how might industries develop? Because I've got to be thinking about if it's not copper and nickel, and, and clearly they are two preferred products, what are the alternatives and should I position in some of the alternatives because maybe this is going to be difficult. So that's about business planning, positioning yourself for opportunity, but it's also about, you know, I've got seven kids. I want them to have a better life than I've had. And for the first generation in I don't know how long, we're probably not going to give or leave our kids with a planet that's in as good a shape as we found it. So your active optimism, this is what you're working on. Um, can we do it by 2050? Because that's the, you know, the one and a half degree goal that everybody has sort of glommed onto, says that we need to be net zero by 2050 globally. Um, are there enough minerals by 2050 or, or should we be running a book as to when we actually might be able to get the minerals required? Look, if we started today connecting these conversations the right way and talking circular economy, talking scope for and solving the real problem, yes, we'd get there. But unfortunately, we're human. We're human. Uh, we have our own issues. We have our own agendas. We're in different countries. We have different views on the world generally. And it's going to be a bumpy ride. And it's going to be difficult to get consensus on those matters that need to have consensus. But that's not going to stop many of us working as hard as we can, annoying lots of people, having good conversations with people like yourself, who I see dedicated to try and make a difference. And these are the right conversations, at least if we can inspire people to think and, and stand up and get involved and take the time to understand how these things work, we can make a difference. And I think we've all got to try and make a difference. And just sort of for the record, I think 2050 we can't, not just because of the minerals, but there are other reasons. Um, but 2070, which is you know, nearly 50 years away, we definitely can. And so that's kind of a two degree world, which is better than where we're headed right now, which is whatever it is, 2.5. Yeah, but for me, it's not a physical so issue. It's human nature that'll be the barrier. It'll be, we will be the only barrier 
to stopping ourselves getting well, there. We, but that would be broadly, that will be human nature, that will be the economy, that will be uh, the capital invested in existing uh, in, in the capital base. There'll be other priorities. Um, you know, Ed Conway um, talked about, in when he, the author of Material World, talked about how much steel. You and I have got 15 tonnes of steel embodied in the economy in the developed world. And in the developing world and in the global south, there's only a ton or so. So they've got a lot of catching up. And we can't, we, we can't possibly say you have no right to have, you know, metalled roads and decent buildings and concrete floors. Well, that was my point so earlier yeah. about, yeah. you know, four billion people yeah. on the planet. Um, let's stop fertilizers. Well, who's going to make a decision about that four billion we can't feed? Right. And there are just some, it, there's some time constants in addressing that that are very difficult. But... If we just come to the... Sorry, trans- can I make one other point? Absolutely. The institutions on a global basis aren't fit for this purpose. And it's clear as a bell with the issues that we've got on a global basis, they aren't working in terms of whether it's uh, hotspots, in terms of military issues, whether it's trading, World Trade Organization is no longer fit for purpose, a lot of rework across the globe required. All of those things need to be dealt with, and that's something I think we've all got to take an interest in. Um, that's a whole other episode uh, that you know we, we're probably going to have to have you back to talk about <laughs> the governance of uh, of global institutions. And I've just come off the the board of trade, the UK board of trade, and so I'm well aware of, of uh, some of the weaknesses of the WTO. And also, by the way, I've worked with the UN and the weaknesses of that institution. Let's come back to the transition, the actual um, the energy transition. Maybe do a, a, a bit of a deep dive into some of the uh, materials overall. So. Bloomberg NEF, the team that I created, I no longer have an executive role, but I, I still write for them and I use their, I still think it's the best research team out there. Five-fold growth in mineral demand from clean energy technologies. Lithium up, of course, hugely, 14 times uh, more lithium required by 2050. Um, rare earths growth by 11 times, largely because of electric vehicles and wind turbines. Copper six times increase, a huge increase. And this is not an industry, it's not a new industry. Lithium, you could say, well, we're only just getting started, but copper, been around for 3,000 years. Um, Cobalt, very difficult from a human rights perspective, child labor, artisanal mining, that's going to double. We've got, I'm not across the numbers for graphite needed in the batteries, but very significant challenge. How on earth do we deliver those sorts of growth figures? Well, it's it's exploration, it's development, it's it's um, working with communities, getting support for those developments. You go back to indigenous issues; they're all connected, and it requires a different approach. It requires an open approach. It requires transparency. It requires us to help people understand how our industry fits into the scheme of things. And some of the great books that are out most recently are starting to help people understand what we do. Um, but again, it's about dialoguing and getting the message out. It's about these types of conversations. So I had um, Ban Ki Moon, the former Secretary General of the um, UN, came on to cleaning up. I worked with him when we were putting together Sustainable Energy for All, which is now SDG Seven, and um, he came. We talked about human rights and climate change, and he said something absolutely extraordinary. He said. I'm going to paraphrase, but the transcript is there and it's completely clear. He said that climate change is so urgent that we should deal with it first and human rights afterwards. Do you subscribe to that? Well, if we want access to the materials to deal with climate change, he's right. However, I put a very strong caveat around that, is we all have basic human rights. And we all, and, and, and people talk about, FPIC, free prior informed consent. And in my view, and let me be practical, as a miner, as a materials guy, um, accessing the materials we need to, to deal with climate change means that we're going to have to negotiate and find solutions to get access to those materials. That doesn't mean we bulldoze our way through and ignore people's human rights. But at the same time, at some point, we need access to the materials and we need to work out how we can land an agreement 
And so what does that look like? How do we make sure we protect people's rights? But since time immemorial, individuals have given up some rights for the greater good. Uh, I keep thinking when I say greater good, I think of the Simon Pegg movie, but um, I, it, it really, it, that principle of the greater good is something that's really important. But again, protecting of human rights is central to who we are and how we operate. So how do you get that balance right? So how, it's a balance. How do you get that right? But haven't we in the past really, particularly the in the developed world and through our colonial history, we've essentially said, well, you know, the, the greater good is, of course, the greater good as we interpret it. And if that then puts the burdens onto, and some of those burdens just horrendous and tragic beyond imagining, and they've been out of sight, out of sight, out of mind, and in some cases, uh, even in sight and in mind, but not cared about. Well, look, um, people, people know I'm a champion for Indigenous rights, engagement. I'm speaking at the First Nations major group uh, in February, talking about FPIC and the, the application of those basic principles. And I make the point that as a mining company, if you're going to develop a deposit and you're doing it um, expressly in opposition with the local committee, add 30% to your costs because that's what will occur people getting people picketing, barricading, uh, not trying to help in terms of its development. It'll cost you more than you likely can afford if you don't do it with a local community. And, and Anglo-American at Kiveco, where we built a, a, a $5.5 billion mine at 4,500 metres, in the end, through COVID, this is in on Chile, time. Chile? It, no, Peru. In Peru. On in Peru. time, in budget. And don't forget, they've got a record of stopping developments on time, on budget, through COVID. Most important issue, it became the community's project because we sat down with the community and said, okay, what would we need to do for you to be able to support this development? And they came up with 26 projects. It was quite interesting. We then looked at those 26 projects and we looked at the costs and for us to take those projects and substitute them for the things we thought they should have, cost was virtually not, there was no difference. But now that project became the community's project. And so I think the responsibility on us as developers is to work out how we can actually get that conversation where the local community can support. Now, I'm, I'm, not, I'm an optimist, but at the same time, I also recognise there are going to be times when people don't want that development to occur. That's when society has to take a view. Okay, yes, we think they're Concerns are legitimate, we support them. Or someone may say, if you're the only person that's got access to water and as far as you're concerned, nobody else gets water and everybody else can die. The community says, well, wait a minute, that's unfair. We're going to make a different decision. Then someone else has to make that call and, and, and that's how the world works. But we've already established that you know you you are you are without blemishes. You've done these marvellous uh, things. And no, shown that, we've all made mistakes. And, 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 but you've shown that it can be done, let me put it that way. But... The countries in which this is going to happen, Papua New Guinea, you've given the example of Peru, yeah. but then there's Mongolia, there's Russia, there's, uh, I mean, even you know, a country like Serbia, which is kind of, you know, teetering on the edge of, of, of you know, uh, acceptability within the European family. Um, these, but many of the countries are, are very fragile. And, you know, you're expecting these very sophisticated debates about the rights of individuals versus the rights of the collective. And then, you know, um, that you would expect then compensation money or whatever those 26 projects were to be well managed by the local governments. I mean, isn't that kind of wishful thinking? Yes, it is in part. If you look at the work that Catherine McPhail did probably 20 years ago, analyzing countries where mining has been significant, success versus failure, successes have been where governments have had good governance structures, where companies have worked with governments in building communities, and they've had wonderful outcomes, Chile, Ghana, to some extent, other examples of successes, but there have also been those failures. And those failures come back to 
companies not doing the right thing and no governance where the revenues and the benefits of mining aren't being channeled into broader infrastructure development. So as miners, I think we have a responsibility to make sure that we work with governments and we put the governance structures in and support the government building its capacity. That's critical for me. And there's a fascinating conversation, or a very difficult one actually, where the governments are inadequate and then what is the responsibility of the extractive player? Example would be Shell in Nigeria, the Ogoni Delta, sort of, you know, the government was incapable of ensuring uh, that there wasn't, uh, you know, that the, the pipelines were not being breached and, and, you know, oil stolen and causing this incredible uh, environmental catastrophe. And Shell's line at the time was, well, you know, what can you do? That's the government's responsibility. And in fact, was, you know, and, and then there are lots of examples where uh, extractive companies putting the responsibility onto a government, but the government not being capable to deliver. How do you how do you deal with those situations? So so I'm not commenting on the Shell situation. I don't know the details. However, my experience has always been in any of those environments, you have to take accountability for what happens with the government. You have to support and provide support. And we've seen this example where companies have actually provided legal advice, arm's length, through the government so they negotiate in an appropriate way. Because if it doesn't work then it doesn't work for the company either. So we have to take the long view. But the danger is that it's neo-colonialism, that you're sort of supporting the government, propping up the government, and then paying the government and helping the government to negotiate with yourselves as extractive players. I understand, I understand that point. It, the, the intention is not to be a colonialist. The intention is to at least square the conversation so they can adequately protect and represent their long-term interests. So how do you do that? And by the way, a lot of our faith-based work has been about engaging in groups and other players that are supportive, will work with the governments and give them different perspectives that we can negotiate with that help create long-term outcomes. Because if it's not a long-term outcome, it doesn't work for us either. And it's about establishing health, uh, legitimacy of the voice of the, of the, uh, for the local communities. You've used this acronym, FPIC, Free Prior Informed Consent, a couple of times. Tell us about that and some of the, the history, the institutions that, that you've worked with that are trying to promote that and ensure it happens. Okay, Free Prior Informed Consent is the concept where local communities have the ability to say no. And free, so that it is their choice, prior, that is the choice is made before the development occur, occurs. The fact that informed means you've got to take them through the whole proposal and they have the final word on consent. And I think the in principle, particularly for Indigenous groups and local communities, and I see them both, they can be one and the same or they can be different, but I see it for both, is really important if you want to build a partnership with the community. And for me, it's critical. And as I said earlier, if you don't have the, the support of the local community, add 30% to your cost, in my experience. So you want that to occur. However, from time to time, it's an almost impossible task to get one individual. And I, I can give you examples where nine out of 10 people want the development to occur, but there's one person that stops it. Now, all of this stuff we picked up when we developed what we call the Development Partner Institute, which was a group that was formed out of Northwestern University in the US. Peter um, uh, Bryant was a research fellow or a research partner with the with the, the innovation school. I came to talk about our experiences in South Africa improving safety in the deep mines. And we started to talk about how mining could do a better job with local communities. So we started with a group. Uh, we had faith-based organisations. We had Indigenous groups. Mark Podlatsky from the Canadian, he also ran the Harvard uh, Indigenous program. And a whole range of stakeholders in that group. We said, how can we form partnerships to support and do a better job in the mining industry. So a lot of the initiatives you see came out of, that I work on came out of that original conversation back in 2011.
But there's a lot of initiatives, the, the, many of them perhaps spawned from the Development Partners Institute. But you know, you've got the um, the ICMM, the Institute. Yes. Um, it's the major mining companies of the world. Sixty percent of the right. world's, if if you looked at market capitalization, are the companies that work there. Right. So the ICMM, <clears throat> you've got Publish What You Pay, the World Bank Climate Smart Mining Initiative, Towards Sustainable Mining Initiative, WEF um, Mining Governance, the world. WEF Mining Governance. You've got. Um, uh, the Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance, uh, the Fair Cobalt Alliance, the Investor Mining and Tailing Safety. Why do these terrible things st still keep happening? I mean, is this, you know, you have all these initiatives, um, but are they really just skimming across the surface? Look, I, th there are many good examples of work that they're doing, or many examples of good work that are being done. Irma, which is about making sure that um, the supply chains... That's unite. the Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance. Uh, and, yeah. and, and, and that's also been done with NGOs. So yeah. they've had a big, insane, big say in terms of how that's structured. So lots of well-meaning, and in many cases doing good work initiatives, but again, yes... There's lots of them. Uh, in the DPI, we tried to bring it all together. And the, the ICMM is a great organisation with mining, mining uh, companies represented. The trouble is, it is sometimes seen as mining industry talking to itself. So the Development Partner Institute was meant to be a safe space where the mining industry is a participant with NGOs and representatives, all these other groups, debating the real issues and how we might find common ground with those stakeholders. And they said, we don't want to sit inside a, a conversation with a group that's sponsored by the mining industry. We want a safe space. So the Ford Foundation, other foundations are funding so that we can have a discussion about industry where the industry is a participant, not the convener. And that has tended to build in some momentum. And, and there's a lot of interest around that conversation today because of the nature of the work and that's and about, conversations. So that's about moving from ICMM, mining industry talks to itself, to uh, this principle of free prior informed consent, which absolutely is all about other stakeholders. Well, it has the good, to be. Well, the good news about the ICMM, it's a group of members that believe in doing a better job and looking at policing those standards across its industry and being a participant yeah. in those conversations. What the NGOs are saying is, well, we're not going to sit inside that group. We, we're happy for you to be a participant, but we want a neutral space. We want a safe space for those debates. It is different. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to move back to the, um, the need for these new minds because um, in my space, the thinking is, look, we're going to need five times as much of this, seven times, 14 times as much lithium, et cetera, et cetera. But can you put that in perspective? Because the real numbers, those are assuming that they seem to be an assumption that that's coming from zero or that the only industry is the energy industry. The reality is something like the copper industry is that we're using an awful lot of copper already. Yeah. And so although we need to, inc to increase the energy use of copper, it's not five times increase in the copper industry, is it? No. Well, the one point I would make is that you've got to remember that we're scaling down thermal coal operations, which, which are land hungry, if you like. And we're changing the nature of the mining. I was in a Cape Town session where I talked about demerging the thermal coal mines and, and one of the uh, people in the session, one of the NGOs said, it's wonderful, no more mining. I said, well, no, we have to mine more copper, we have to mine more nickel. And, and I said, from an, an area intensity point of view, it's probably less than thermal coal. So the good news is we'll disturb less land. But there's lots more copper, lots more nickel, because that's where do you think these materials come from? Volume for volume, it's actually tiny compared to coal. Right. And the, the fly ash from coal, people, everybody's, oh, you know. You're, so it's a um, net positive uh, outcome. Turbine blades are being scrapped and PV creates all this waste. And it's this minuscule amount compared to just fly ash from coal. Um, so it is reducing. Um, so just the figures that I've got is that if we take um, 85 million cars built every year uh, and they're going to need, let's say, 80 kilos of copper versus 20, um, you do the maths and it works out that we need 5 million tonnes more copper per year of an industry that's already producing 25 million tonnes. So it's only a 20% a increase. Yes, your, um, your point about it, it, the, the five times consumption is 
an energy sector number, not necessarily a global consumption of that product. That's correct, and it depends on the products. But I also make the point that if we don't have enough of a particular product, there are substitutes in many cases that can be used. So that's why I'm saying that I'm a little more optimistic that we can balance consumptions with different products depending on availability, but we are still net short, I think, but not as desperate as it sometimes appears from some commentators. One of our most popular episodes was with Simon Morish, who's the CEO and entrepreneur behind x a cable from Morocco to the UK. And I'm, you know, for disclosure, I'm a small investor. Um, but the core of that cable will be aluminium, not copper. So substitute, of course, copper would be better, but copper would be a lot more expensive. So substitution is very, very real. Um, ah, but now, I think that scratches at how we might think about different financial models in our industry. So, for example, uh, the bulk of India's electrical reticulation is using aluminium. And one of the things we were talking about, if we thought maybe the copper consumption isn't what we'd like it to be, this is going back a few years, maybe we could sell the copper at a much lower price and then charge a rental fee that it was a, because copper has a much lower cost, the life cycle of the asset than aluminium. So we said, well, why don't we become a little bit smarter and say, look, we'll sell it lower, but we want a rental fee on an annual basis that gives us the equivalent of the savings that copper has compared to aluminium. There are different ways we can think about the way we we, we use and, and uh, finance our products. So straight after we finish this conversation, I'm going to go and buy the the URL, the internet domain, copperasaservice.com, <laughs> because that's what you're talking about. It's yeah. copper as a service. Right? Yeah. Um, but we're going to need a lot of new minds. And one of the challenges, one of the criticisms of, of net zero, uh, the potential showstoppers, is that this just takes an awful long time, 16 years to open a new mine. So we've got these materials. How long will it take to open the new mines, copper, nickel, that's the business of value-based metals specifically, um, but also graphite, cobalt, uh, molybdenum, all of these kind of uh, weird and wonderful materials we're going to need more of. Do they really take 16 years to open mines and to produce output? Because if so, we're going to be very behind on net zero. If you looked at basic processes for approval, making sure the environmental issues are covered uh, and all the community issues, you could you could develop mines in somewhere between five to seven years. And, and we've got examples of seven years for copper mines. The 16 to 20 years that we're now seeing across the globe is more a function of government processes and requirements and duplication and these sorts of issues and a lot more um, stakeholder interest and input. I wouldn't like to reduce the right type of inputs, but I believe that we could certainly get it back to seven years, which, which, which would make a big difference. But uh, it depends on the jurisdiction. Some have got the capacity, some don't have the capacity. So it's, it, it is a challenge. It's hugely important, this issue, because if it's we've got 26 years to 2050, which is this iconic year. Um, and so if, if it's a seven year cycle, start the process, open a mine, start the process, open a mine. We've got to find the mine first right. and but find the ore body. But you've got kind of four cycles. But if it's 16 years, you've got two cycles. And so um, in one world, we probably will, will get largely there, maybe not all the way there. But in the other world, we just won't. But we are seeing expedited approval processes in some parts of the US, in other parts of the world. But it's, uh, they're the exception, not the rule. And, and we need a lot more of that going on uh, to help. But again, I also say that we need to make sure all the key issues are properly covered because, again, the worst thing we want as an industry is to see a bad example because everybody remembers that bad example and, and we can't afford that sort of press, I guess, is the right way to say it. We don't want to see it either. And I want to finish by going back to the two themes that I said that we were going to kind of push on, which was um, can we get the minerals that we need for the transition and then can we do it right? Um, so where I'm coming out, I think we can. I think we can do it right. I'm perhaps less optimistic, less actively optimistic than you, that we will do it right in terms of justice, and governance and so on. Um, but I'm not sure that we'll do it fast enough. Now, now, and I would agree with you on both points. For me, the longer period you have, the better you can do it. 
the imperative, the time imperative is a big one. And with the time imperative, there's more chance for tripping up on the way through. So what's the worst evil? But again, in our interest as an industry, we've got to do it right. We've got to connect with our stakeholders. We've got to make sure that local communities are, are properly served. You've got to make sure that the country benefits from the development. We've got to make sure that those materials go to the right places to make a difference. And there's a lot of things that have to go right for us to get there. So I think you're being realistic. I'm being maybe a little optimistic, but I've always been a little bit more on the optimistic side. Uh, but at the same time, I'm not sitting there saying I'm hoping I'm out there with people like yourself talking about the right issues and trying to encourage those things to occur in the right way. So we've got to do it. We've got to do it right. And we've got to do it fast. Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. Michael, absolute pleasure. Thank you. So that was Mark Kutifani, former CEO of Anglo-American, now chair of Vale Base Metals. As always, we'll put links in the show notes to the episodes of Cleaning Up, which we mentioned. That is Ed Conway, episode 149, The Material World, and Simon Morrish, episode 92, which was called 650 Leagues of HVDC Under the Sea. If you've enjoyed today's conversation, please remember to like, share, and subscribe to Cleaning Up, or leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. And do please spread the word. Tell your friends and colleagues. And if you want more from Cleaning Up, sign up for our free newsletter on the publishing platform Substack at mlcleaningup.substack.com. That's mlcleaningup.substack.com or visit us on cleaningup.live. That's cleaningup.live.